You worth uh, $11.5 billion. How did you make your money? In the spring of when I was 16 years old, I literally got sued probably 100 times. A born hustler, first million was made at 16. Now I thought I was gonna go to jail because I couldn't pay the bank. I had um, five ski shops by the time I graduated high school. I, mean, I actually did buy a Porsche as a 15 year old. That was part of the reason I went bankrupt if we're honest with each other. I was working 100 hours a week as a 15 year old, 16 year old, 17 year old. Do billionaires have a group chat? Is it like you, Mark Zuckerberg? Well, we want you in the group chat, of course. You're a co-owner of the 76ers. By the time I was 21 years old, I was the largest wholesaler of closed-up footwear in the world, doing $100 million, making $10 million a year. Damn. Is that a dream? Like, you sitting around at 12, like, I want to be a billionaire one day. No, not at all. I realized, like, you go to what you're good at, and I was literally good at nothing but working, so I gravitated to what I love to do. The only thing I was good at was business, and I was good at it from the time I was a little kid. And, like, for me, you always go to what you're good at, and there was one thing I was good, always good at, like I could work, like I loved to work. I loved business, I loved making money. Not because I cared about the money, but for like the sport of it. Because again, you gravitate to what you're good at. So I did start in business li literally at like eight years old. Literally when I was eight years old. Eight years old, I probably had like five different side hustles. I mean, I was selling trading cards, you know, by the way, not to my friends, but to my friends' parents, because they had the money. I would go and sell you know, stationary door to door. I'd sell vegetable seeds door to door. I would go like door to door. It was snowing. I would get five kids to work for me. And I'd literally sell, sell the snow shoveling. But I'll tell you what, I could sell those doors really quickly. And you know, it snowed and we could do thousands of dollars in business as an eight year old. And I had all the kids working for me. It was, it was very efficient. Well, I don't think for me, even at eight years old, it was ever about money or wanting to buy things. I think it was always about doing what you're good at. You know, for me, I was always, terrible student. I was always an awful athlete. I was really like one of the most awful students known to mankind. I'm the most unathletic person in planet Earth. So I was always good at one thing, which was business. So I always loved business. I just always loved business from the time I was a little kid. It was just something that I really enjoyed. So um, I said I wasn't a good athlete. The only sport I was somewhat good at was skiing. I was always pretty good at skiing. And so I started skiing as a kid, three, four years old with my parents. It was like the, the thing we did over the holidays together. And so I grew up a skier. I, um, I went to a ski camp uh, one year. So I went to a, a place called Mount Hood um, where I went to a, a summer ski camp. I learned how to tune skis. And I came back and this is really how the real business started. I learned how to tune skis and a friend of mine said like, hey, you love business. It's really the only thing you're good at. You love skiing. Why don't you start a little ski tuning shop in your parents' basement? I did that when I was 12. And then a year later, there was a bunch of ski shops where it didn't snow the previous season. They had all this excess inventory. And um, I helped um, a ski shop, it was called Bauman Ski Shop, sell their excess inventory. And I said, hey, why don't you lend me some of your excess inventory? So I put it in my parents' basement. I took it on consignment. And literally a 13-year-old, I did $25,000 in right. business. This is before you knew the word consignment. I didn't know what consignment was, but I was consigning everything. And it was, right. by the way, that could have been my most profitable business year ever when I was 13, because I had no overhead, I had yeah. no employees, and yeah. I was literally making 50% profit on everything I was selling. And then a the year later, I went to my parents, I said, hey, I found this little ski shop, it's $800 a month to rent, I want to open a ski shop. And I actually, you know, the one thing I needed for my parents was to co-sign the lease, because I was 14. I had opened a retail ski store about um, 10 minutes from where I grew up in Lafayette Hill, suburban Philadelphia, and a shopping center about 10 minutes from my parents' house. Mike's Ski and Sport, right? Mike's Ski and Sport. <laughs> and I've been dealing with people over the last year, and so I wasn't buying them the stuff, so they all kind of gave me credit. No one had any idea I was a 14-year-old kid. They thought I was like, you know, you know, just a young business person. And being a 14-year-old owning a ski shop, you get a lot of media attention, so that helped drive the business. Wow. And if a 14-year-old owns a ski shop 30, um, 32 years ago, that's like a very big story because it was pre the internet, pre all these yeah. technology kids. It was, it was truly a different world. It's not unusual for high school students to enjoy skiing, but it is unusual, however, for a high school student to own a ski shop. Mike, a sophomore at Plymouth White Marsh High School, opened Mike's Ski Shop in Plymouth Square Shopping Center when he was just 14 years old. Mike started the ski shop on his own. He didn't ask for a nickel from his parents. He talked ski equipment suppliers into giving him lines of credit, and he's been very successful. And, you know, I thought I was king. Mm -hmm. And here I am running the ski shop, I'm doing $100,000 the first year, and then $500,000 the second year. And then I got a little bit cocky. And I started spending money like crazy. <laughs> I did 
buy half a Porsche, yeah. which I was not legal to drive. Half a Porsche? <laughs> yeah, and I bought it with a friend, and I hid okay. it down the street from my family. And by the time I was 16, I had um, a bigger ski shop. And at the end of the season, it didn't snow. You're in the ski business, and it doesn't snow. Oh, it's that exactly. does, it doesn't do very good. Right. You've never heard of Mike's Mountain in Plymouth meeting? Well, that's because it wasn't here before this morning. If it was up to me, we'd have the Plymouth Square ski hill, and the whole entire parking lot would be a ski hill. 16-year-old Mike Rubin owns Mike's Ski Shop here in Plymouth meeting, and he wanted to give his business a lift. So I was literally 16 years old. I had $200,000 in bills. I had $120,000 in inventory. Mm -hmm. A Porsche. And um, I was going bankrupt. Because I didn't have the money to pay the bills. I mean, I'm going down, I'm basically going bankrupt. And I was in such bad shape that the sheriff from Norristown actually became a really good friend of mine because every day in February, March, and April of when I was 16, she dropped off a new lawsuit of somebody suing me. So I'd wake up in the morning before I'd go to school, she'd come and she'd drop off the lawsuit, and I probably got sued a hundred times as a 16-year-old because I couldn't pay the bills because I had $200,000. Vendors and stuff. Yeah, I had $200,000 I owed to vendors, and I had $80,000 in inventory, and they have to push. At 16 years old, being $200,000 in debt, by being sued a hundred times, I was unfazed. Right. Literally yeah. unfazed. And so basically, I had a bankruptcy lawyer. And I, I thought I was dumb. Like, I was dumb. I was done. It was over. And the bankruptcy lawyer says to me, how old are you? I said, I'm 16. He said, what? I'm like, yeah, I'm 16. He's like, well, I've got good news for you. You have to be 18 to, to, to legally incur debt. I'm like, well, so what's that mean? He's like, well, I think we're gonna have a much easier time dealing with the situation. You got all the vendors together and they had like a meeting of the vendors and people were like rallying at me. They were really rightfully right. so mad. And um, he said, you know, Mr. Rubin owes you $200,000. Um, and, you know, we'd like to offer settlement. They said, we won't settle. I said, well, Mr. Rubin's 16. Right. And um, everyone's face color changed. And so uh, I settled my debts for $38,000. The problem was I didn't have the money. And that was the only time I ever went to my parents for money. I said, hey, can I borrow $38,000? And $38,000 was a tremendous amount of money to anybody. And certainly $38,000 was a ton of money, um, you know, whatever, 30 years ago. And, you know, my dad said to me, I will lend you the money. On one condition. Uh, you agreed to shut the business down and go to college. So I agreed. He <laughs> said, absolutely, Dad, I'm, I'm in. I'm ready for college. I've completely failed in business, and let's go. And so he lent me the $38,000, and then, um, fortunately for me, and unfortunately for my parents, a week later, there was another ski shop that went bankrupt. It had $250,000 of inventory, and it got auctioned off for $13,000. So what do you think I did? What ski shop? There was only one problem. I didn't have the money to pay for it. So I bought this ski shop for the, I bought all the inventory for $13,000. And so I went back to my mom and said, hey, I just need $13,000 more. And I was like, are you out of your mind? Like, you think I'm giving you another $13,000? <laughs> right. Hell no. But now, by the way, I thought, now I thought I was gonna go to jail because I couldn't pay the bank. It was like, I, now, now I had to pay the $13,000 off. You got yourself into this mess, go figure it out. So I started going door to door and I went to neighbors and said, who wants to lend me $13,000? And someone said, hey, I'll lend you the money, but it's a great deal for you. So I want $1,000 a week interest. Holy Ooh, cow. Ooh, wow. That's some juice. So, so, so you, so you, you, like you took a loan from someone for $18,000 that would cost you $52,000 a year. Is that about that's, the math? That's 100% right. Um, seemed like a great deal to me because nobody oh. else wanted to give me the money. So I borrowed the $13,000 and instead of selling the merchandise piece by piece, you know, in my, you know, at retail in my store, I started going through the yellow pages to find other ski shops that I could sell it in bulk. Not the yellow pages, I just when they had phone books. Going through the yellow pages to find the ski shop. Hey, you know, this is Michael Rubin. I've got some uh, excess skis. Would you like to buy them? I can be like 50% off. And within three weeks, I sold like 10% of the inventory and paid back the $16,000, the $13,000 yeah. plus the interest. And now I had all the ski inventory left. Okay, I had like 80, 90% of the inventory left. It got me into a brand new business, a close-up business. And the reason I tell you this story is that at, you know, 14, I had this great success. At 16, I was nearly bankrupt. By 18, I was the largest buyer and seller of closeouts in the ski business. And by the time I was 21 years old, I was the largest wholesaler of closeout footwear in the world, doing $100 million, making $10 million a year. Damn. Wow. So for me, I mm -hmm. tell you this only because I failed so many times, but every time I fail, it kind of leads to the next success. Okay, so uh, then we get to GSI Commerce. So my old company, GSI Commerce, that's where we started the licensed sports business. And um, we started that business in 1999. It operated most, if not all, aspects of big retailers and big brands e-commerce businesses. So um, brands like Ralph Lauren or Burberry or Kate Spade or retailers like 
Toys R Us who takes sporting goods. You gotta tell the internet story. Yeah, well, well so it, it's kind of all related, so. The internet thing came in 1998. I knew nothing about it, because I was like in business free the internet, so I was, you know, kind of, you know, didn't really understand. I wasn't like a young kid who grew up with the internet. It was kind of, I was kind of ahead of it a little bit. Every business, no matter how large, no matter how small, will be on the internet in the year 2000. It's how, the primary way that people will look up information. It will replace the yellow pages as we know it today. Are a lot of people just getting on to the internet because they feel that they have to get onto the playing field, so to speak? But it's very hip to be on the internet right now. And, um, there was, we were a public company. We had about a $200 million value of the company. And there was one person who was an analyst who actually followed our company. His name is Mike Hahn, and he was an analyst on a Wall Street firm, and he called me up and he said, hey, Michael, what are you doing about this internet thing? I'm like, ah, screw the internet. Who cares about the internet? It's all these young kids. All they do is lose money. Don't waste my time with this internet thing. And uh, I hung up on the guy. And he calls me back. He's like, Michael, you should really think about this internet thing. And so I did what any entrepreneur would do. I called the CEO of the Sports Authority and the CEO of Models and the CEO of Dix. I said, yeah. what are you guys doing about this whole e-commerce thing? And everyone said the same thing to me. They said, look, we don't really understand e-commerce, but our board of directors are asking us lots of questions. And you know, if you have any ideas, please bring it to us because you're young and maybe you can figure it out. So in 1998, I reinvented my company. I got five of the top 10 largest sporting goods retailers to give me their e-commerce rights over a long period of time to run their e-commerce business. And that's how we started, which then over time, we started to work with lots of other retailers. So it became the biggest kind of infrastructure for big retailers to run and big brands to run their e-commerce business. So if you went to Ralph Lauren, or you went to Burberry, you went to Kate Spade, you went to Dick's Sporting Goods or Toys R Us or GNC, we ran um, major aspects of their e-commerce business. And it became a pretty big company. I sold it in 2011 to eBay. It was a public company. They bought it for um, $2.4 billion. And, and um, so that's how you made your first initial huge, huge money, I guess? Yeah, ab yeah. Ab ab absolutely. I sold GSI Commerce for $2.5 billion to eBay in 2011, which was the first company I started, because I felt that was the best thing for the company. And when eBay acquired my company in 2011, they didn't want to own any businesses that owned inventory. So I bought back multiple businesses from eBay, including Fanatics. But I had one fundamental belief when I bought the company back in 2011, and it was that there were two companies that were gonna own retail in the whole world. And that was Amazon and Alibaba. Essentially, my belief was these two companies were ten taking over all retail. So my belief was always, you have no chance to win in retail or e-commerce against Amazon or Alibaba if you're not completely differentiated. So we basically believed there were two things we had to do. One, we had to verticalize the business. And to verticalize the business, that means we design, develop, and sell directly to consumers the products we make. So kind of think about like H&M or Zara or Uniqlo, kind of in the modern online version, much more online driven and much less kind of store focused. Only 2% of what we sold in 2011 were our own products that we designed, developed, and manufactured. Now it's over 50%, and in another five years, it'll probably be 75%. Most of what we sell is exclusive. You have the to, license, to, nobody yeah, else can it, do it's it. It's exclusive to us, and if you go to Amazon that you keep talking about, you can't find 90% of what we sell at Amazon because it's exclusive to right. our sites online. So when you think when the New England Patriots won the Super Bowl, and Tom Brady's right. wearing that T-shirt to celebrate the win of the Super Bowl, that's a T-shirt that we design, develop, manufacture, and sell directly to the consumer. So Fanatics is the largest retailer in the world of licensed sports merchandise. Um, you know, we have three businesses today. The first business is our merchandise business, we call Fanatics Commerce. In that business, we do own Mitchell Ness, we own Lids, we operate all the leagues, e-commerce businesses. So you go to NFL Shop, NBA Store, NHL Store, MLB Store, 900 individual team sites. We have uh, a big collectibles business where today we own Tops. We've also won all the rights for the NFL, the NBA, WWE, UFC, NCAA that are all gonna come on board in the next um, few years. And then we just we just started in, in the online sports betting business. We launched in Tennessee and um, Ohio. Look, I think for fanatics, you know, what's our dream? Like, what are what's our North Star? We want to have that Fanatics app where you can go and you can get your merchandise. Every and you one-stop shop. Yeah, you, it's, it's one-stop shop. You can get your merchandise, you can get your collectibles, you can trade them, you can, you can bet your, on your sports, you can watch live sports. Now that's really dope, man. I, I love it. When we spun out of eBay, when I bought it back from eBay in 2011, it was a $250 million business the year before. Um, you know, next year we could be, you know, we're getting close to a $10 billion revenue business. 
Now, let's talk about the 76ers. How did you become co-owner of the 76ers? How did you do that after you sold GSI? The guy that owned the Philadelphia Sixers was my next door neighbor, Ed Snyder. Ed Snyder called me. He said, hey, I want to come over. And he came over with a bottle of uh, champagne. He said to me, hey, Michael, you know what? You should buy the Sixers from me. He said, I'm, you know, I'm selling the team. He said, Michael, um, you know, I'm not a basketball guy. I'm all about the Flyers. You know, I really almost like I hate basketball, I'm not into this thing. Do you want this team? I'm like, nah, like, it's, you know, it's not for me. I was losing 30, 40 million dollars a year. You know, I'm like focused on fanatics. And I said, nah, I'm not interested. He says, you know what? I don't, you know, I like you too much. I don't want you to buy the team. <laughs> okay. Then Josh Harris and Dave Blitzer put a deal together to buy the team. They were looking for a local partner, and that's when I met them. And he sold the team to Josh and Josh Harris and David Blitzer. And in addition to that, team wasn't actually going to lose 40 or 50 million dollars anymore. It was actually on a path to making money. I called David Stern. I said, hey, you know, I met Josh Harris and, and David Blitzer. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, kind of doing this with them. Um, we're having these conversations. What do you think? And David said to me, hey, you know what, Michael, you do whatever's best for you. If you want to do it, you do it. If you don't, don't. And then my phone rings. And about five minutes later, he says, you know, I thought more about this. You're the only one I know. If there's ever an issue, I know to call you. So I want you involved yeah, with this. I want you to right. do and, 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 and that's how I got involved with the Sixers. So it was wow. a combination of Josh and David putting the deal together. And David Stern told me he thought it was a good idea for me to do it. I grew up as a diehard Sixers fan. I love the Sixers. I want the Sixers to be great. The Sixers were my team as a kid. So getting a chance to, you know, kind of just be a part owner and pretty, you know, involved in a team that I grew up with being a fan, it was super special. Mm -hmm. Super special. And I actually realized that, you know, I can have an impact people and people will take something away from me. And I love that responsibility and opportunity. I like to learn from people and I like to help people. And that's the way like people have always been with me. Like talk about Robert Kraft, he's helped me so much in business as his, his you know, his oldest son, Jonathan Kraft. These guys have been so helpful to, to just helping me build fanatics. And, like the same way they've helped me, I want to help other people. So and the most important thing is enjoying what you do every day. I don't think about financial success. I think about like just loving what I'm doing. Now, financial success can tell you, are you winning or losing? That's your report card, that's the scoreboard, right? Good financial results means you're winning, bad financial results means you're not winning in the current moment. But for me, like, I just wanna love what I do every day. Did you ever at any point stop trusting the process? Never once.